The title of this class, just to make sure, they do that on planes, you know, they say this is the plane going to Florida. If you're not going to Florida, you're on the wrong plane. You know? Well, this, is, this class here is 1 Corinthians, Practical Letter for a Troubled Church. If that's not the class you came in for, then uh, there are other classes uh, being taught throughout the uh, building. As you know, I normally teach a book of the Bible, one verse at a time. You know, we do verse by verse, passage by passage, work our way through the entire book. But I'm not going to be doing this for this particular letter. Instead, I've chosen key passages throughout the first letter to Corinthians and we'll be developing those as we go from week to week. So for lesson number one, we're going to be focusing on chapter one, verses 18 to 31 of the first chapter, a lesson entitled, The Foolishness of God, The Foolishness of God. So I would ask you to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. We'll be staying in that book. Uh, I think everyone has, uh, or there should, be enough, uh, there should be enough lesson notes for those who like to take notes and just follow along in that way. I think we have enough. If we don't, uh, Bob can go print off some more. And I would ask uh, the class, if this is the class that you're going to be in, I would ask uh, as a little bit of homework that you read 1 Corinthians on your own so you can be familiar with the entire book as we work our way through it. So you kind of refresh your mind in your regular Bible reading. And so we'll begin in 1 Corinthians uh, with our study. Now to better understand uh, this uh, lesson and all the lessons that follow it, I suppose it'd be helpful if we, uh, if we had a little background about the particular congregation that we're talking about in Corinth and why Paul wrote to this particular church in the first place. So just a little geographical and historical background help us to set the scene here. Corinth was a uh, commercial center of Greece. It was the commercial center of Greece about 50 miles west of the city of Athens, and it was four times the size of the city of, uh, of Athens. It had a population at the time of 400,000 people, making it the fourth largest and fourth richest city in the Roman Empire. So it was a pretty, you know, it was a pretty, important, uh, pretty important city. Uh, also, as we know, those of you who've studied this book before, uh, it was also uh, a pagan city, a lot of wickedness in that city. And it was here in the years 52-53 uh, AD that Paul established a church right in the shadow of Athenian philosophy. And um, the, um, the Greeks uh, held uh, Athena, the patron of Athens, or the goddess, the patron goddess of Athens. Uh, she was the goddess of the arts and crafts. She was the uh, patron of the city of Athens. She was the goddess of wisdom. As a matter of fact, some philosophers accredited to her the, um, uh, the creation of the world. By her wisdom, uh, they said, the world was created. Well, after uh, establishing this congregation and moving on to other works, uh, Paul that is, a delegation of, of people from the city of Corinth, from that church, came to him uh, with news of uh, serious divisions and problems that had arisen in the Corinthian church. And so 1 Corinthians is one of several letters that Paul wrote to this church in order to deal with its, um, its many problems. One of the main problems stemmed from the fact that this church was made up mostly of Greek or Gentile converts. And uh, the problem there was that unlike the Jews who were well trained in moral living and religious worship to God, you know, the Jews had, they had long history of, of right living, of moral living. They, they, you know, they had been trained by the scriptures for that kind of uh, lifestyle. But the Greeks, they came from an, you know, an extremely immoral and sexual background and they had many false ideas about God and religion which had been planted in them by a long history of Greek philosophers and pagan religious teachers. So you, you're taking these two people that come from two very different backgrounds culturally, but they also come from an extremely different background morally. 
uh, one well-trained, well-versed in the morality of scripture, uh, the other uh, very immoral. As a matter of fact, some of their practices, the Greeks, some of their practices, uh, as far as religion is concerned, uh, involved sexual immorality, which was anathema to the, to the Jews, of course. So because of, of this mixture, because of trying to meld these two groups together, they had uh, a lot of difficulty in adapting to the Christian lifestyle than the, uh, <clears throat> than the Jews did. So they were, they were either slow in maturing or they tried to mesh their former pagan ideas and philosophies with the teachings and the practices of, of Christ. Whereas the Jews, uh, there was less of a problem in Corinth as far as this was concerned. And so uh, a delegation from Corinth reported problems with sexual immorality and poor conduct during worship uh, they were misusing spiritual gifts, and of course there was the very dangerous issue of divisiveness. So in writing to them about all of these problems, Paul tackles the issue of divisiveness first, seeing it as the most dangerous. He doesn't talk first, he will talk later on about sexual immorality and all this, these other issues, but the first thing he tackles is the problem of divisiveness. You know, if the church divides, there's no opportunity to work on the other issues. You know, when it, when it, and that's 2,000 years ago in Corinth, and it, the same is true today. Any church has a lot of different issues, but if there's a division in the church, boy, you, you, know, you can't work on any of the other issues because people are just too busy you know, fighting with each other. And so in verse 10 of the first chapter, he said, now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and there be no divisions among you. So when we continue to read his letter, and if we know some of the habits of that culture, we learn the nature and cause of the division. There was a division going on in that particular congregation. What was it about? Well, Paul talks about some of the solutions, but you have to read between the lines to know what the problem was. Well, the problem was this. In those days, various trained speakers, called orators, would develop a following by staking out a position on a philosophy or a political idea and debating others on the merits of their position. It was a little bit like a King of the Hill. Anybody ever play that when they were a kid, King of the Hill? Of course, in the, in the north where there's a lot of snow, I remember uh, you know, the, 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 the guy would come with a tractor and he'd plow the snow in the schoolyard and they'd plow it all into one corner. And that thing was you know, like a story high, two stories high, a big snow, snow mound. And at recess time, we'd play King of the Hill. You know, we'd scramble up to the top and then you had to fight everybody off. You know what I'm saying? Then when they pulled you down, somebody went on the top and they were the King of the Hill. Well, this is a little bit of what was going on in Corinth. It was more a, an oral King of the Hill, a debating King of the Hill, but this is what was happening. And it was this system that Paul encountered when he was in Athens and invited to preach on Mars Hill. It was at Mars Hills that they'd play King of the Hill. They'd talk about new ideas, new philosophies, new religions, and you know, people would listen, they'd approve, they'd disapprove, whatever. Well, this sort of idea was starting to creep into the church. Now these debaters, professional debaters, would build up a following based on their skills at public speaking and formal, uh, formal debate, a little, by, a little bit like um, uh, verbal gladiators. The better they were, the bigger their following. And, that, and, and this was a social phenomenon of the times. Well, as I said, this type of thing was beginning to happen in the church with different teachers staking out positions which they claimed were endorsed by an apostle or a church leader. So they, some of them would say, well, you know, I'm arguing the position of Peter. And another would say, well, my position is consistent with Paul's teaching. And then, of course, somebody would come along and trump all of them and say, well, yeah, but what I'm doing, this is what Jesus, you know, what would Jesus do? So their, their thing was, what would Jesus say? And they would stake out that position and say, what I'm teaching is the truth according to Jesus. And so you know, they were busy debating each other. Now, the Greek Christians in the church were adapting a familiar form of intellectual exercise to the practice of their faith in Christ. So this is, that's the scene, that's what was going on in that particular church. 
And that exercise, that phenomenon, was, create, was starting to create divisions in that congregation. So in dealing with this problem, Paul states in verse 17 that his preaching was not based on cleverness of speech. And that idea, cleverness of speech, that refers back to the debaters and the orators. The cleverness of speech, clever oratory, debating skills. Paul is saying, my message is not based on clever debating skills. Paul goes on to say that this system not only produces division, but it also makes void or empty or useless the cross of Jesus Christ. Now his idea was that by relying on the power of persuasion and debate, in order to convince people to believe, they took away the power of the cross and the power of Christ to draw people to faith. In other words, he was saying, people are coming to faith because you're, you know, you're winning the argument. Has that ever happened? Have we ever done that? I've seen it, I've seen people, you know, okay, I'll believe because I got nothing left to say to you, you've talked me into it. And this is what was happening here. So in the passage that we're going to study today, Paul shows how it is very tempting to use human methods to bring people to Christ because God's method, and God's method is preaching the cross, God's method seems so foolish by comparison. So in chapter one, verses 18 to 31, he gives the Corinthians three reasons why God's way to save people seems foolish to human understanding. And that's the core of our lesson. First of all, he says that the message itself is foolish. The message is foolish. I mean, human beings through their own reasoning and schemes and plans and philosophies have never been able to provide real hope for the world. I mean, there have been plenty of ideas, plenty of philosophies, plenty of schemes, but all of them fall by the wayside sooner or later. No human system gives complete peace of mind and sure confidence in facing death. Let me ask you this, if someone is facing death, the idea that we live in a republic, is that comforting to you? The, if somebody is dying from, from cancer, the idea that the uh, stock market went up 160 points today, is, is that very hopeful? Well, no. And mankind has not been able through its own efforts to know the mind of God. Of course, this has not stopped one thinker after another to offer explanations and solutions to the mystery of life and death. So Paul explains to the Corinthians how God's plan, how God's solution compares to all the other solutions, compares to all the other plans, ideas, philosophies of men. So let's go to chapter one and let's read together verses 18 to 20. He says, for the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? So Paul says, you know, the message seems foolish to the wise, to the debaters of the day. And what is God's message? Well, God's message that through the death of one, everybody else could have eternal life. Now, you know, we're Christians, we've heard that message a lot, but think now, back in the first century, they've just heard that message for the first time. It seemed foolish. I mean, after all, what possible connection could the dying of a poor Jewish carpenter have to do with the life of a Greek businessman a thousand miles away? I mean, what possible connection could there be? Of course, he says, for the one who believes that this was no ordinary Jewish carpenter, but in fact the Son of God, his death and his resurrection, they make a lot of sense. 
and they provide a message of hope that people are looking for. So let's keep reading verse 21 this time. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So the fact that the world considered the message nonsense was nothing new, he said, nothing new about that. The world has never understood God's message for the most part. And he talks about Jews and Greeks. Jews were not content to hear the word of prophecy fulfilled. I mean, think about it for a second. The Jews, they saw Jesus fulfilling all of the prophecies they were familiar with, but that wasn't enough. I mean, the Jews knew the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament. They knew the scriptures, and here was Jesus in front of them. He was fulfilling every single prophecy that they knew about, every single thing that the prophets said that the Messiah would do. Jesus was fulfilling them day after day in front of their very eyes, but that wasn't enough. They wanted a spectacular sign. They wanted a spectacular wonder in order to be convinced of Christ's identity. You know, they wanted a miracle like the sun standing still in the sky, or manna coming, you know, they wanted one of those miracles. It wasn't enough for them, the miracle of fulfilled prophecy, that wasn't enough for them, they wanted more. And that's what Paul is saying for the Jews, you know, they want a sign. And then he talks about the Greeks, the Greeks or the Gentiles, non-Jews, they wanted the mysteries explained. You know, all their philosophers, and all, they wanted all of those mysteries explained. They searched for wisdom in human terms rather than the solution offered in Christ. You know, for, them, for them it was like, yeah, 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 die, resurrect, I get it, but tell me about this mystery over here. <laughs> it was right in front of them, they couldn't see it. So on the surface of it, to base your hope of eternal life and joy on the preaching and the promise of a dead Jew executed as a criminal, well, that was pretty foolish on the surface. But Paul reminds them that for those who did believe, the wisdom and the power of God would be fully revealed to them. If you believe, it would be fully revealed in Christ. You know, the Corinthians understood what he meant because their faith had been rewarded with great spiritual powers and gifts. They believed, and what was happening to them? Some of them can speak in tongues, in other words, unknown languages. Others had the power to heal. Others could prophesy, and so on and so forth. So their faith had been rewarded with the power of God. So Paul lays out a great truth here for his readers, and it's a truth that applies even to us uh, today. He says, first of all, faith comes before insight. You want insight? You have to believe first. And they were asking for exactly the, well, give us the insight, and if, you, if we have the insight, well, then, then we'll be led to believe. And Paul said, no, it works the other way around. First you have faith, then you receive the insight. Uh, another idea, expressed rather in the same way, believing precedes understanding. Okay, God, if, I could, if you just make me understand everything, you know, all the questions, you answer all of my questions, you, know, and I, you lay it all out for me, then I'll believe in you. It doesn't work that way. You know why? Because He's God and you're not. <laughs> he gets to set the rules. And then thirdly, most importantly, Obedience first, rewards second. I don't know how many times you know, I've seen people 
who have not obeyed the gospel pray, Lord, if you do this and if you do that, then I'll do this. We even do that sometimes. But I've seen people who have not obeyed the gospel, you know, kind of trying to bargaining with God. You know, if you do this, if you, you know, reward me in this and answer my prayer, this and that, well then I'll, you know, I'll believe, I'll repent, and I'll be baptized. That never works. It's not the way it works. So for those who accepted Jesus in faith and obedience, what seemed foolish to the world became through experience and insight the wisdom and the power of God. These Christians here in Corinth, they believed and then they saw the power of God working in them, not vice versa. Okay, another reason why God's way to save men is foolish. The messengers were foolish. So the message was foolish and the messengers were foolish. Read along with me. Let's pick it up in verse 26. He said, for consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world and the despised. God has chosen the things that are not, that He might nullify the things that are, that no man should boast before God. You know, we've talked about people who try to change the world. <clears throat> what kind of tools do people use to change the world? Well, they try to change the world with power, military power. Or they try to change the world with intelligence, you know, a new philosophy or a new social system. Or they try to change the world with religion, you know, new prophets, they come and they go. They come and they go. Now these are the types that create waves and magazines write about and history notes their achievements. You know, you'll get in Time Magazine, the hundred greatest you know, influencers, you know, the top hundred, the most influential woman you know, or man or system. You know, the, the, the newspapers write about these people. Now Paul says in contrast, the messengers of the gospel and the recipients of the message, you know, apostles and their disciples and the Christians that follow throughout the ages, he said, they have no such credentials. He says, there are not many wise. There are some wise, but they're not many, he says. There are some great thinkers. You know, we have many books, but not many. There are not many who are powerful, not many who are rich. There are some. I've known Christian millionaires, but boy, they're in the minority. Paul says that God has deliberately, and the key word is deliberately. It's not like he didn't have a choice. He deliberately chose the weak and the lowly and the powerless to bring the message that ultimately changes people's lives in ways that no other message or system can. So the messengers may seem foolish in the eyes of the world, but the results of their message in the lives of those who believe cannot be denied. You think about the person who brought you to Christ in some way, and I'm sure all of us have a different story. It could have been a spouse or a friend or the local youth minister or just a, lay, a teacher or something like that. Think about that person. Were they powerful? Were they wealthy? Were they influencers in the world? Were they movers and shakers? Probably a, a homemaker or some guy that was you know, working in a local factory or a school teacher or even a minister. You know, we don't have any power. It was a person like that. But can you deny the power of change that has taken place in your life because they brought the message to you? Absolutely not. Their power and wisdom was a message to the world that God could take something weak and something despised and something foolish and transform it into something powerful and holy and wise. Something that the great leaders in the world had failed to do with all of their abilities. Failed because of the method that they used and yet they consider God's methods foolish. 
You know, they laugh at our method, but our method works. It actually changes lives. Okay, third thing, we need to move here, we're almost done. In comparison to the world's solution, our message and our messengers are foolish. And the third thing, the method was foolish. God's method is foolish. Let's finish reading the passage that we're studying. Verse 30 says, but by His doing you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. We agree that God's ways are not man's ways. What does it say in Romans 11.33, how unsearchable are His judgments, how unfathomable are His ways? Man is either reasonable and logical, looking for the connections between everything, or he's totally selfish and hedonistic, searching only for the pleasure and satisfaction uh, that life can bring. You know, we're either Dr. Spock up there with no feelings, you know, pure logic, or we're playboy. We, we want just gratification of our senses. Humans fluctuate between these two extremes and they judge in those terms. But God is spiritual. He does things on another plane beyond human reasoning or feeling. How many times have I heard people say about God working in their life? Well, it doesn't make any sense. I, you know, it just, well, there I was and there it happened. I don't know how it, you know, God sure works in mysterious ways, but He does. There's no you know, cause and effect. You can't, you can't figure it out. The method used to save man from the consequences of sin, which are guilt and shame and fear and suffering and ultimately death and condemnation, that's what sin does, right? Remember the last time you sinned? I mean, really sinned? How'd you feel? You feel good about that? No, usually we feel oh, stupid. There. Um, you know, we're, we're even ashamed to acknowledge the dumb things that we've done, the bad things, that, the shameful things that we've done. That's what sin does. So the method used by God doesn't answer to man's reason or feelings because it's not subject to logic. It is rather foolish if you compare it to man's standards. The method is called imputation and the motivation is unconditional love of God. That's God's method. The method of dealing with our sins is called imputation. I'll explain that. Paul summarizes the idea of imputation in verse 30 by saying that all of the things that we need to be in order to be saved from death. So what do we need to be in order to be saved from death? Well, we need to be wise, we need to be knowledgeable, we need to be righteous, which, is, which means acceptable to God. We need to be sanctified, which means pure. We need to be redeemed, which means free from sin. We need all of those things in order to be saved. So how does God accomplish this? Well, Jesus becomes all of these things for us. And through faith in Him, these things are imputed or they're put on us as if we truly possess them and thus we become saved. It's like a coat that covers you from head to toe and that coat that garment is called righteousness, purity, re redemption, wisdom, so on and so forth. Jesus removes the coat and He puts it on us. That's imputation to put upon. That's how we're saved. That's God's method. So Jesus obtains these things through a perfect human life, a sacrificial death, a miraculous resurrection, and then we get them because we believe in Him. This believing, we can do that. We can't do the knowledge part. We can't do the pure part. We can't do the righteousness part. We can't do the free from sin part. We, can't, we can do them to a certain degree, but we can't do them in the quality and the quantity necessary to save us. We can't. We're unable to do it. So Jesus does it for us. And then through our association with Him, He imputes those qualities that He has to the degree that He has them onto ourselves. Makes no sense, does it? It absolutely makes no sense whatsoever. 
And so things that we as humans could never obtain through any method, like absolute purity, absolute righteousness with God, absolute freedom from sin of any kind, absolute knowledge of God, God gives it to us freely because we are associated with Christ. You know that term, in Christ, that means I'm linked to, I'm associated with Christ. And how am I associated with Christ? Through faith. Jesus obtains them through a perfect human life, a sacrificial death, a miraculous resurrection, and as I said, we get them because we believe in Him. And why based on faith? Because that's the only thing we're able to do. We're able to believe. That we can do. We can believe. So God gives to us the thing that we can do. We can believe. And He has devised this way of doing things because He continues to love those who hate and disobey Him. You know, man would have never figured this out and continues to laugh at this method as the solution to man's problems to this very day. The method seems foolish, but for those who are in Christ, it is a solution for which they continually praise or they boast in the Lord. I don't boast in anything else except what God has done for me. You know, I think the greatest insult to me as an individual in this society is to be considered irrelevant. It seems that the serious people who are in charge of solving the problems of the world would put preachers at the very bottom of the list of those who might offer a solution to the hate and the fear and the unhappiness and the disorder. And one reason why many, you know, that's one reason why a lot of men don't go into ministry. They don't like feeling irrelevant. They don't like feeling powerless. Because men, you know, they like to fix and so on and so forth, but preachers are really, in this world, they have no, no power of this world. We don't exercise any of that, of that power. We are irrelevant or foolish because our message requires belief in what is unseen. We're uh, irrelevant or foolish because our messengers are without influence or power or prestige. We are irrelevant and foolish because our method demands the relinquishing of human effort in favor of total dependence on God. And yet, and yet for those who believe, the unseen has become real and powerful in their lives. For those who believe, the method has removed the fear and guilt and replaced it with hope and a sense of meaning and purpose in life. For those who believe, this has resulted in themselves becoming messengers for the foolish things of God, confounding the wise and the powerful in this, in this world. I remember when I left my job and I told my boss at Smith & Nephew that I was going off to become a minister. And his words to me were, well, we were just about to promote you to this position to become more powerful, more influential in the company. You'll be able to supervise you know, a, a whole area of, of people. And what he was doing was, he may not have done it consciously, but what he was saying was, you're going to be doing something where you have no power. And I'm offering you something where you will be able to wield power. It was quite a temptation at the time. You know, I think we should rejoice if we're considered foolish or irrelevant because this means that they have at least recognized us for what we truly are, <laughs> Christians. Jesus says we should rejoice if we are persecuted for being His disciples. Being considered foolish and irrelevant is a form of persecution. So how does the world see you? Are you one of its own? Wise, strong, noble, relevant? Or are you one of the foolish ones that believes in God's message and method preached by one of His messengers? How will you resolve your fears, your judgment, your eternal life? Are we going to rely on ourselves? Will we just ignore it? Or will we let the foolishness of God clothe us with forgiveness and salvation and eternal life? If we believe in Jesus and God's work through Him, then we are one of the foolish ones. But the foolish ones see the power of God working 
in their lives. 